Good morning and thank you very much everyone for joining us today. We at the Coalition for Global Prosperity are delighted to be hosting this event with the Project for Modern Democracy to celebrate the launch of their new report in the national interest, the past, present and future of UK development policy. The Coalition for Global Prosperity was set up three years ago because we believe that Britain is at its very best when it acts as a force for good in the world and that a smart and effective aid budget leveraging British expertise can and does transform lives across the world. As we will get into later on, we know that investing in international development is not merely a gesture of altruism, important as that is, it is truly in our national interest. Now, over the past year, the UK government has promised maximum impact from our aid budget through the integration of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office merger and strategic thinking informed by the recently published integrated review. This report therefore comes at a critical time with the FCDO set to define a new path for UK aid over the coming decade, this report puts forward recommendations for the future of UK development policy to ensure Britain continues to be a global leader in this really important policy area and why it is in our national interest for us to continue to do so. I will shortly introduce our speakers, but before I do, um, please, please submit your questions as the event goes on into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I will do my very best to get to as many as I can as the event goes on. Please also type out your name and your organization too. I'm now going to hand over to our first panelist, Nick Herbert. Nick is a member of the House of Lords, is a long-standing campaigner on global public health, is a former Conservative MP and Minister, and is the Chair of the Project for Modern Democracy. Nick, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ryan, and I'm uh, delighted to be joining this panel. I'm very grateful to the Coalition for Global Prosperity, which I think is a fantastic organisation, uh, for hosting the launch of the Project for Modern Democracy's report. I chair the Project for Modern Democracy, uh, which is a small think tank uh, that principally focuses on uh, government reform and effectiveness, but uh, has also done some work in other areas and uh, international aid is one of them. And a few years ago, we set up a project called the Global Development Challenge, uh, which received some funding from the Gates Foundation. And the first thing that it did was to look at uh, the question of whether aid works or not. And we did a detailed comprehensive desktop study of all the research that had been done on the impact of aid globally. And uh, we found on a very careful assessment uh, that the uh, uh, balance of the evidence is that aid generally works, that it does work to uh, alleviate poverty. And I think it was a useful report that we published uh, about three years ago. We've been working on the second part of the Global Development Challenge, which is to look more specifically at the history of development aid in the UK and uh, tracing that history uh, through uh, the uh, various entities that have led finally to the creation of the new combined uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. So uh, a large part of the report, uh, which we published today, uh, is very interesting about the history and about the original reasons why uh, the Department for International Development two decades ago was created as a separate department. Uh, and then some analysis on the critique of aid and some explanation as to why it was felt that the departments uh, should be merged. Um, for better or for worse, uh, that has happened. And uh, we examine uh, some of the evidence from overseas uh, where uh, combined foreign and international development part departments were created as to how successful that's been. And uh, the rough conclusion that we draw is that where the intention is to strengthen development, uh, such merged entities can be uh, very useful and, and successful and powerful. 
but where the intention is actually to deprioritize development or to subsume development into some broader conception of the national interest or foreign affairs interests, uh, those mergers have been less successful. And I think there is some quite important learning there for the government. The other thing we look at is uh, the uh, uh, question of uh, how much money should be spent uh, on development assistance. And of course, the uh, recent cut in the uh, aid budget. And uh, I would uh, just like uh, to, to say that I, I think the problem is that, that the, uh, the, the, the cut in uh, the ODA budget that the government has uh, announced um, is of such a scale, uh, losing uh, a full third uh, of ODA in uh, one year, that it will require very sharp reductions to uh, programs uh, that are funded by o ODA um, because of the commitments to multilaterals that have to be maintained. And the government hasn't yet announced what those cuts uh, will be, but we already know some of the areas that they are looking at. And frankly, it's horrible. Uh, we're looking, um, at, for instance, at cuts to research and development in global public health, uh, which would be completely inconsistent with the government's commitments to science, uh, with its ambition for the G7 agenda to prioritize global public health and in the wake of all the epidemic and the learning uh, from the epidemic. Taking a full third out of the budget, which would have reduced in any case, uh, simply uh, doesn't make sense. I don't think that it uh, was thought through. I think it will result in a waste of resources as the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, said yesterday. And uh, most of all this, and this is where it's highly relevant to the report, I think this will undermine the ambition of global Britain that was set in the integrated strategy uh, that was published a few weeks uh, ago and of the creation of the new combined foreign and commonwealth uh, development uh, office. And it is notable that um, just as the United States has a new president who has reprioritized development, uh, uh, is resetting uh, the United States position on the world stage, has appointed a formidable figure as the uh, administrator of USAID, who actually has a seat on the National Security Council, we in the UK no longer have a senior minister who is dedicated to development. So we are completely out of kilter uh, with our major partner uh, in these issues. So I think that uh, the government needs to rethink uh, that, and I think it needs to rethink uh, the aid cut. Uh, and so the report makes a number of constructive recommendations um, about uh, how an aid program should be shaped and what the priorities should be. Uh, but let me just conclude by saying this. One of the key uh, points that we make uh, is that um, the case for aid was not being made by the government and effectively the case for aid was lost. And that is in the end why uh, the Department for International Development uh, uh, lost uh, in terms of being an independent department and was rolled in uh, to the Foreign Office. And there is something extraordinary about a government that is spending billions of pounds on a programme that dares not speak its name. And uh, I think that the time has come to make the case for aid. And if the government believes in aid, believes in development, believes that it is spending the, uh, the money wisely, which overall we think that it is, and uh, it, this is unique in that it's a department uh, who, whose spending was tracked, um, would that other Treasury programs had such uh, uh, scrutiny. If the government believes all that, then it needs to say uh, why uh, that aid is effective and why that money uh, is being spent. Thank you very much, Nick. I will now turn to Mavis Uwusu Jianfi. Mavis is Executive Vice President at the African Center for Economic Transformation, an African think tank focused on supporting countries to develop and implement sustainable growth strategies that benefit its citizens and improves their well-being. Mavis, over to you. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's a great honor to join you today and to be part of this esteemed panel. I'd like to begin by commending the Project for Modern Democracy and the author, or authors for an excellent report. I mean, I, I think that by taking us through the history of UK aid over the past 60 years, they are able to identify some salient points for consideration as the UK government, especially FCDO, works through articulating what it means by global Britain. I mean, we have a great 
strap line, but we still need to articulate what we mean by that global Britain ambition. So um, given how interconnected the world is, um, and we've seen that so starkly over the past year with the pan pandemic, it is so obvious that the choices that the UK government makes on how it spends its aid is intrinsically linked to the country's own national interest. It cannot afford to disengage as there will ine inevitably be spillovers um, effect from what happens in other countries, both positive and negative. Furthermore, with, a with the British diaspora making up 14% of the UK population and with a rapidly growing number of second and third generation diaspora children, a couple of us are on the webinar today, I don't think we can afford to take for granted the fact that how we spend our aid elsewhere does not matter to what happens in this country. The right choices will benefit us as a country by giving us access to new markets and helping us to further grow our economy and generate jobs. We need jobs in the UK too. And if we can sell our product in countries that we have helped make stronger as markets, we can generate employment opportunities in this country. The wrong choices, unfortunately, will see us constantly dealing with emergency aid conflicts, etc. So um, it is good to see the focus in the new plan that came out a few weeks ago that the UK will use its capabilities to address global challenges such as global health and climate. The UK, I feel very strongly, needs to retain its clout within the multilateral system, but use its influence to ensure the multilateral system becomes more effective for the 21st century. Um, however, I would caution the heavy focus on aid and the insufficient attention that is being given to development assistance. There are a couple of areas that I think um, should be considered more strongly. The first one is working with countries to drive the transformational and systemic change that citizens of those countries are asking for, especially the youth are calling for their countries to transform economically and politically. This means that the UK can apply its political and economic expertise to understand the complex political economies that it's working in and the context of each country partner. And I think the merger might actually help bring political expertise coherently to this development effort. Um, and I, I, we can't underemphasize the importance of this transformational and systemic change agenda. Um, I was um, a young trainee in DFID when Suma was permanent secretary. So I was influenced a bit by that. The second thing is really investing in innovation. I think one of the things that we really saw as a strength of the UK government in the early noughties was the innovations that it invested in. You know, everybody talks now about the greatness of M-Pesa in mobile money and the spillover effect of mobile money around the world. DFID was one of the first organizations that took a risk in investing in this new, and at the time, what was considered a crazy idea. So as we think through green development, as we think through um, a rapidly changing world with health pandemics, climate crisis, et cetera. There is a really new market for new innovations and also thinking through how you can invest in a digital economy. And I think the UK is well positioned to spend its development assistance in this way. The third area is for the UK to drive you know, stronger coherence in the international development community. This is something that the UK used to be at the heart of once upon a time. And at the moment, if you go to a number of African countries, you don't see that coherence amongst international development partners that we used to have 10, 15 years ago. And it would be great to see the UK drive that agenda. And this is going to be really important in a post COVID world where there are limited resources to begin with. And so we really need to think about how do we all support a coherent approach in the countries that the UK is prioritizing. And finally, to focus on reform and to focus on transformational development actually means that the 
concern that we constantly see in the UK about we've been in this aid business for too long. When are we going to exist? We are going to over time see a large number of countries start to graduate from the traditional kind of aid that it, re um, it receives from the UK and become strong market partners for Great Britain. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much, Mavis. Um, I will now hand over to Sir Suma Chakrabarti. Suma is Chair of Trustees at the ODI, uh, one of Britain's premier international development think tanks. Uh, prior to that, Suma served as President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and was Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Justice. Um, over to you, Suma. Well, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be part of this panel with uh, Nick, Mavis and uh, Tom, old friends, all of them. So it's great to see them all. I, I think uh, I managed to get to the bar and Tom didn't clearly yesterday. But um, but anyway, I have probably let, I have an easier starting point on hair than Tom does anyway. But um, great to see you all and uh, really re also reconnect with Mavis after a long time. So it's very good indeed. Look, I, I think I, I, I can say much less now because uh, Nick and Mavis have covered a lot of the ground, but. I think this report is actually really, really important. Hats off, I think, to the Project for Modern Democracy for the work uh, it's done on this report. I, if, I take it as a sort of two-part process because the first report showed um, that aid uh, is effective in terms of its basic objective of reducing poverty. But this second report is a more sort of uh, taking a look at the governance of how we do aid and what we should focus on. And I think it's, uh, it's a really good uh, development. I saw a lot of my past floating before my eyes, I'm afraid, as I read it, um, the Pergao Dam scandal. I was in the private office at the time when that happened. Um, so um, I think it's great. I think the basic point that it lands, which is very important, is that to assist poorer countries to develop, to reduce poverty, is not just altruistic, uh, but it's also actually part of our national interest. And the second point, which I think has rather been forgotten in uh, recent years, unfortunately, is that actually the UK is rather good at this. It is actually one of our comparative advantages compared with many other nations. This is why the UK became, in some, in some people's eyes, a development su superpower. Not just the financing, but the quality of the knowledge, the quality of the diaspora outside of DFID as well in the UK, in the think tanks and universities and so on. Uh, it is one of the things the UK is rather good at. And the report, of course, now arrives on our tables at a time when uh, the context in the UK is rather strange, as, as Nick uh, outlined, politically very odd, uh, that uh, it's a very rigorous study, but at a time when actually some decisions have been taken enormous in a rather non-rigorous, rather casual way, uh, the merger, uh, of course, but on top of that, the really huge cuts, particularly in bilateral aid, as there will be, and the impact it's going to have on people on the ground. Uh, I think it's also rather unfortunately going to damage the whole global of Britain ambitions in terms of authority in COP26, in the G7, and others as well. So I think uh, there's a huge uh, impact this report can have because of the context that we're living through right now. On the, uh, on the report itself, I, I, I particularly liked, um, I think, the, the idea of actually trying to show some linkages between foreign policy and development policy. Whatever one's personal views on merger, demerger, uh, I think it's uh, really, uh, there are some areas where actually uh, having foreign policy and development policy closer is a good thing. Uh, climate change would be one of those issues, I think, uh, one of those themes that I think is really quite helpful, actually, to have the two institutions working together as one, if you like. Um, I think it also is very good at uh, highlighting some comparative advantages, global health, research and development as well. And I think I do like the fact that it is uh, pushing the use of the multilateral system uh, as well. One of my criticisms of DFID, and this is obviously like an old man, you know, it was always better in my time, but uh, I think uh, I have felt in the last few years DFID became too narrowly focused on uh, just uh, very much talking about conflict countries and very much thinking in the World Bank is the only multilateral that matters. Was actually, if you look at the regional development banks, one of which I led, if you put them together, they actually um, are far bigger than the World Bank in terms of financial uh, spending, but also in terms of certain skill sets, uh, because the, the multilateral system is a sort of architecture of different business models. They're not all uh, substitutable. 
And I think um, it's good that the report focused on the multilateral system as well. And I hope the new FCDO does more uh, through the multilateral system. In a way, it's going to have to because its bilateral uh, programs have been cut so heavily. Uh, so I think we'll push them towards that. I think at the same time, while I, despite my critique of DFID, I think um, it's a bit surprising that the report underplays, I think, the fragile states uh, agenda. Um, I think it's still a very important agenda. Uh, it's something that UK is, has been focused on. So I don't think that so either or. I think it's not just middle income countries or fragile countries. I think Britain needs to have an agenda for both as well. And I think this report is good on pushing more towards the middle income countries. But I think it, we can't forget uh, the work to be done still in the fragile states as well. The last point I really wanted to make is a sort of back to the future, if you like, point. Uh, one of the reasons uh, it was a real pleasure to lead as Permanent Secretary of DFID in the era of Claire Short was that she did think development was more than just aid. Uh, and actually, that's what the government at the time thought. And so it was very, very um, irritating for other departments in Whitehall. The DFID at the time was getting into issues like export uh, licenses for arms and things like that. The whole purpose was actually to say Britain's impact on developing countries was more than just the aid budget. And it was right to have a ministry that would actually challenge uh, the other areas. And I think it's, uh, it's important uh, in the way the report says to try and do more of that. And I hope the FCDO can do uh, much more of that. Uh, lastly, I think um, it would have been good to have more on inequality and more on digital as well as two other themes. Climate change comes through, global health comes through, but those are two other themes which are touched on, but I think not brought out as fully as I would have liked, I think. And they're the coming agendas, I think, uh, in, uh, for, for the development people um, in the UK and elsewhere as well. But overall, I really like this report. I think it's made a great contribution to the debate. Thank you very much, Suma. Uh, I now turn to Tom Tugendhat, MP, Tom is the Conservative MP for Tombridge and Malling and chairs the UK Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Prior to entering politics, Tom served in the British Army, serving in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and as one of the military assistants to the Chief of the Defence Staff. Over to you, Tom. Thanks very much, Ryan. And uh, yes, I speak as the hairiest uh, man on the panel, with the sole exception of you, I think, actually, Ryan. So you, you've, dodged the, uh, you've dodged the sheep shearers clippers as well. Um, Look, this is a this is a fascinating subject, and I have to say I pay tribute to, to, to the authors of this report. I presume it wasn't Nick, but the uh, <laughs> but, but whoever actually <laughs> whoever actually put the work in, um, because it's it's a it's a, a very it's a very good piece of work, and it's and it's suitably challenging. And I um, I must say I'm going to pick up on some of these themes rather than um, rather than doing a critique of the report, because I think the, the, the questions that it asks are entirely relevant to how we think about um, aid today. And I, I hear the point that people make about the cut in aid, and I think it's a reasonable one of the 0.7 to 0.5, and Nick's point about this is about a third of the cut, a third of the budget going in a one-up, which is a hell of a hit, and certainly does ask questions about global Britain and prioritization. It's also worth putting this in context. You know, the United States, spends about 0.16% on, uh, percent on development. Uh, the UK is still at 0.5. Now, I realise that America's 0.16 is greater than our 0.5, uh, but it is worth looking at the context. And though uh, you'll find no uh, greater fan of Samantha Power than me, uh, she was a fantastic witness before the Select Committee only a few months ago and, and has a a breadth and depth of understanding of not just uh, aid policy, but actually wider foreign and security policy uh, than many, many people I could uh, rattle through. Um, you know, she is still second to the Secretary of State. So it's not like the US doesn't have a merged uh, department as well. And, and I think this is where I, I, I must say, I found Mavis's points uh, particularly uh, fascinating because I think one of the, errors that we've made, and I, 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 I'm very cautious in saying uh, this is a different error because it's not, it's an error that's been made across the whole of government, which is to view aid as separate from policy. Now, actually, the people who've realized uh, that this isn't so, by and large, have been different experts who have realized that uh, aid spending, development spending is a political act, and it's a political act that brings with it consequences. I've, I've, I've usually found that those 
and differed the ones who are most attuned to it. But I have found other areas of government not always appreciating that. And I think, therefore, the merger and therefore the united effort is hugely important. And this is where I'm, I'm just going to go on to some of uh, Sasuma's points. And, and as usual, Sasuma gets to the heart of the issue rather more astutely than I will ever do. So forgive me as I as I make a hash of this. Um, but I am, I feel, excuse me, coming after uh, real experts, which is that the question of linkages is, is fundamental. The, the integrated review tried to get to this and tried to answer the question of global Britain that Mavis quite rightly says is still mostly a slogan. Um, and, it, and it raises real questions that I think we've got to address because the question of linkages is real. We still see in the UK um, stovepipe budgets. Now we're getting better at it, but they are still stovepipe. We have uh, a, a, an FCO budget, we have a DFID budget, or rather an ODA budget. Forgive me, it's not DFID anymore, but we have an ODA budget, we have a military budget, we have, you know, we have a series of Bayes budgets, education budgets, legal budgets, and so on, that in reality don't work down those narrow corridors. If you look at judicial reform, if you look at uh, security sector uh, investment, you're talking about aid, you're talking about development. If you look at trade, you're talking about aid, you're talking about development. And so when, when I see these questions of linkages, this is where I have to say I am a fan of the Foreign Secretary having much greater authority over these areas. And actually, I would expand it. Um, and forgive me as I uh, refer back to something I've already said, but it, uh, I brought it out in a speech in to Rusi a few years ago. The argument I would make is that we need to be talking about three, four percent on overseas. And what do I mean by that? I mean defense, I mean aid, I mean diplomatic outreach and all the rest of it. Because the reality is if you don't see these things as coordinated, if you see these things as individual line items, then you end up prioritizing that area in which the line item will be spent rather than where it will best have an effect. And it may be, and not always, but it may be that the best use of aid work uh, of aid spending, sorry, will be on a hospital ship for the Royal Navy. It may be that the best development, uh, sorry, defence spending will be on road building to promote trade. It may be that the best trade investment is on judicial reform in a partner nation. You know, there are various ways of looking at these things, which if we look at them through siloed budgets, we risk uh, undermining. And so I have to say there are real challenges under the way that the government has set out its thinking. And I, you know, I do agree with, uh, sorry to use a coined phrase of, of 2010, I agree with Nick that there are um, uh, certainly challenges that this cut in aid uh, commitment raises. But I think that if the UK actually does this right, then I'm, I'm rather more with Mavis on this, which is I think there are opportunities for greater coherence. And that coherence can be much more than a force multiplier. It could actually be an enabler to other partners working better in areas where we actually see uh, real need. The last point I'll make is too much of the partnership that we speak about, and this is where you know it's certainly true that DFID has been absolutely brilliant in, in multiplying the effect of um, the UK and has been rather better at this element again than much of the rest of the government. But too much of the partnership that we speak of has always been with donor nations rather than with delivery nations. And those delivery nations are by and large, uh, naturally, those nations in which the recipients are receiving the help in whatever form it may come. And so I'm much keener to see um, actually a proper Africa strategy that really talks about, you know, female genital mutilation and education that talks about judicial reform and roads, rather than partners of donor countries looking at how we raise money, but actually looking at partners of uh, countries that we're trying to build in not just the ability to receive the money, but actually the responsibility and the accountability for having received it. And by the way, accountability is not to us as the donor state, but of course to their own people. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's submitted a question. Please keep them, keep them coming in. Before I start looking at the questions that, that have come in, I would like to just 
draw out this theme about DFID in a bit more detail. Um, Nick, in the report, there is a chapter which examines the role of DFID and it asks the question, was DFID a success? There's then a list of achievements, which in my mind at least, suggests that it was a success. Um, 74 million children immunized against preventable diseases, uh, 15 million children in fragile states educated. There's a, there's a great list. But at the same time, the chapter concludes by saying that ultimately the Department for International Development ceased to exist because it and its allies lost the argument for international development. Um, Nick, how did a department which, if measured against impact, was clearly successful, still go on to lose its independence? Uh, I think it's a great question, uh, Ryan. Um, and I think what, what the report says, uh, and what I tried to say in my introductory remarks, is that the problem was that, 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 that the department wasn't permitted to make the case for development. I mean, ministers were at one point by one prime minister literally banned from giving interviews about uh, our international aid program. You know, it was refused on the grid. You know, um, there was a sort of rather sort of simplistic approach was taken. You know, the, the focus groups tell us that uh, spending this money isn't, isn't very popular. So we don't really want ministers out there saying, you know, why, why we're spending the money. And what was happening is that I think the government was actually sort of running shy of the tabloid headlines. Uh, and um, although I, th I think there's a, I think there is a sort of benign reason for uh, creating the merge department and, and Tom sort of rather eloquently set out what the sort of strategic intent uh, might, might be. And then I think there are the rather uh, less attractive reasons, uh, which is to, which is potentially um, uh, to sort of deprioritize development um, and uh, is born of a sort of irritation um, about the sums of money that are, 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 are being spent and a lack of enthusiasm uh, for them. And what our report says is that if you have the right motivation in creating a, a combined foreign and development ministry, then there, uh, the, the evidence suggests that that can be successful, exactly um, as, as, as Tom suggests and, and hopes. Uh, but if you continue to take the view that development is somehow an embarrassment, uh, it leads you uh, to what the Treasury has done, uh, which is to spring on uh, the new department, um, in spite of everything that was said beforehand, a, a, a sudden and very large in-year cut. One, by the way, that in one sense makes little sense given that the budget would have reduced very significantly in year anyway because of the reduction in the size of the economy because it was a target that was linked to the size of the economy I mean, here is one budget in government that actually is going to fall very sharply at a time where other budgets of course are rising uh, 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 very sharply so so if 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 the point was that either we need to save money or we need to be seen to save money well that was going to uh, happen anyway so i think the government is kind of schizophrenic on these issues at the moment you know, on the one hand, saying that aid matters on the, uh, uh, and that international uh, uh, development matters, that uh, this uh, new, new department will be sort of more powerful and more strategic uh, uh, and so on. And then the other hand saying, actually, it matters uh, to us uh, so little and is such an embarrassment to us that we are willing to take a full third out of the budget in one year um, uh, uh, and so on. So I think the government needs to decide whether it wants to make its integrated strategy and the new department work or not. But effectively, what I think it has allowed is the treasury on a populist drive to torpedo the successful creation of, 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 of the new department. Uh, and, uh, I don't think the treasury should be allowed to, uh, dictate foreign policy in this matter. And if you, it, 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 for me, it's of a piece with the attitude the Treasury has often taken on these matters, for instance, in driving the sale of some of our embassy buildings around the world, often actually um, at ruinous loss to the public finances, but certainly uh, at a loss to, uh, of prestige. I mean, for instance, the sale of the embassy building in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Thailand in Bangkok, uh, just down the road, the, the United States has an embassy. I cannot conceive they would ever have done the same thing, yet we did. Thank you, Nick. Would any of our panelists like to come in on that? Yep, Tom. Tom, then Suman. 
Uh, look, I, I, I mean, I have to say, I completely agree with you. I, I find myself in a somewhat bizarre position of um, not always being a fan of everything that's, forgive me, Suma, not everything that's been spent and having been quite a critic of aid spending in Afghanistan, where, um, uh, as uh, my uh, old and now very dear friend, thank God, uh, we made up, Lindy Cameron and I used to have uh, quite serious arguments as to the way that money was spent in Helmand when she was in charge of the DFID program in Afghanistan, and I was advising the governor of Helmand. But the, the fact is that what aid has done for the UK, or at least did for the UK, is change the calculus of many countries into the way in which they thought about the international orbit. And if we don't think these things matter, then we only have to look at other countries who are using aid to do that. Now, quite clearly, the vaccine diplomacy of China and Russia is one element, but actually a much more important element of this is the way in which China is investing very heavily in different programs around um, Africa, Southeast Asia, and many other places. Now, you can, if you wish, you can call it debt diplomacy, although I think that's a rather unnuanced way of looking at it. I think what you're looking at is a, 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 an industrializing nation throwing out cash, as industrializing nations do. America did in the 50s, we did in the 60s, 70s, and, uh, and uh, in many ways, Japan did it in the 80s and 90s. And what we're seeing is that money, yes, it's building the bridges and the train lines and whatever else it is, but it's also buying the UN votes that sees uh, China go from having one UN agency uh, leadership to now having four, and by the way, having strong influence over many others. And this therefore changes the way in which the international rules-based system that we built and we invested in uh, works. I mean, it's a little bit like building a democracy and they're not fielding candidates. You know, you do feel that this is a bit daft. We built a system that works in a way that promotes the rule of law and the basis of, uh, you know, our own uh, security. And now we're sort of saying, well, you know, get on with it. Other people can play with it. Well, there's a cost to that. And the cost isn't 0.7% and it not quite calculable in the same straight fashion as a budget line for the treasury but it is seen in every ship that isn't insured in the city it's seen in every trade deal that doesn't include a uk or in fact a democratic port and it's seen in the change of the standards of the industry of the modern industrialization uh, which is of course digital and the way in which the internet is moving uh, towards a uh, great firewall sort of digital nationalization, if you like. You know, we're seeing this, and this is the direct result of us being unwilling to play the role that we had in the system that we built. Sina. So um, I just want to come back on one point, actually, because Nick brought it out rather well, which is the, I think, the change role of the Treasury. So in my career, um, when it was ODA, um, the Treasury was a stronger supporter of, of trying to keep the ODA budget as high quality as possible. They, they saw that as one of their, of course, they were never going to give us much money, but, that's, uh, but they wanted to protect it from over commercialization. It was a stronger supporter during the Pergao Dam uh, period, for example. And they also wanted to keep ODA as a distinct body within the Foreign Office. This is quite an important sort of political economy point because they actually were fearful that if there was one accounting officer for both FCO and ODA, you would have problems. You'd end up having conflicts of interest. Um, now you couldn't always uh, present against that. You had the Pergao Dam, for example, but by and large, actually, that um, arrangement worked. What has changed, of course, this time around is now there is only one accounting officer for the whole uh, department budget and the foreign office budget and so on and in a way um the permanent secretary at the foreign office a good friend of mine he's going to have to um deal with these conflicts of objectives which will arise even in even though of course tom is right there's plenty of stuff you can do which is not con controversial at all and should be done together there will be some areas where you know the foreign office impulse will be one direction the development impulse in another the, that was very very important that treasury approach i think it's quite interesting that Treasury has gone back to its old ways in terms of cutting budgets. That's, a, that's one thing I'd expect to, to do. But I, I'm, I was surprised that they didn't um, ensure a double accounting officer 
uh, role when they when it was there was a merger. I was actually quite surprised by that. Um, it's one of the reasons actually when ODA became differed, it was actually quite easy to do compared with most machinery of government changes because actually it was distinct within the FCO. So it's a lift and shift basically. Uh, whereas you know I had to run both defed and then Minister of Justice another machinery of government change. And Mission, uh, Ministry of Justice was much more complicated, as Nick knows, because actually some of the things have not been sorted out in terms of accountability. I mean, Nick and I are working on this in another context at the moment, the Commission for Smart Government. But actually the DFID uh, machine government change worked because of the Treasury protection uh, when it was ODA within the FCO. I think that's a big change uh, in terms of support within Whitehall that the old ODA used to enjoy uh, that has gone, I think, now. Uh, so the other thing I, I would uh, just ask ourselves is whether the consensus that grew between the major parties on development spending and what it should be spent on quality, has that also uh, changed or is there a new consensus? Is the opposition? Um, it's not terribly vocal on these issues, in my view. Um, uh, and you know, it'll be interesting to see whether a judicial review does happen. I, I see Harriet Lamb um, is on this, uh, on the, on the Q&A, and Harriet, of course, was involved very much in the judicial review of the Pogao Dam uh, project. But it'll be interesting to test that view of the development community um, as well, whether they are going to accept this new consensus or whether they're going to actually challenge it to some extent, uh, even if they accept the institutional arrangements can't be changed. Uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see that as well in the coming months. Thank you, Seema. Uh, Mavis. So just very quickly, building on Nick's point, um, I think that one, without being a comms expert, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've had in the UK is being able to share the success of development beyond the numbers of children in school, etc. We, you know, a lot of um, the general public in the UK who are concerned about the money that is spent on aid are concerned that we will never exit out of aid, but we never show, we, we've never been able to successfully communicate the successes that have happened thus far. So let's take the pandemic right now. Yes, a number of African countries do not have the capability to produce vaccines and need vaccines to be, um, you know, need the COVAX facility. However, we should not underestimate the health systems that African governments have and are able to deliver vaccines using innovations, et cetera. And all of this has come from partly UK's extensive investment in health. The fact that we have four countries in financial, in debt crisis in sub-Saharan Africa and the rest moving toward debt distress, but being managed is because of the extensive investment that countries like the UK made on public finance management, on budget systems, et cetera. The, the crisis could have had a much bigger impact the need from the UK could have been a lot bigger, but we, we seem to struggle to communicate the progress that has been made thus far. Looking across the African countries that are going through potential debt distress right now, the improvements in their debt management capability compared to the early noughties when we saw the last crisis is vastly different. But somehow we seem to forget to share those successes at this time when it's happening and always go back to the emergency crisis challenging issues when they come up. So I think there's also an onus on us as a development community to do a better job on working with comms experts to tell the progress story. Thank you, Mavis. I wonder if I can stick with you for our next question, which comes from uh, Catherine Mohan, Restitution. And Catherine's question is, what are the implications of the cuts for the global debt situation and the potential lag in the economic recovery of the global south? For example, uh, the global south is more significantly behind than before because of COVID. So we know that the economic rebound of the global south is going to be a lot slower and it's going to be a lot more challenging because a lot of countries have not diversified as much as they should have to be able to rebound better. However, 
let's look at the countries in sub-Saharan Africa where we are going to see a positive growth um, in 2020. Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana. These are countries that have actually diversified via economies and they've diversified it with support from a range of partners, including the UK, who have invested in helping them develop their markets, helping them to um, look at other, um, diversify into other market opportunities. So thinking about Ethiopia and the textiles industry, thinking about Ghana and production, we've seen the evolution happen. I think what is going to happen with the cut is if we see the force, you know, Okay, at the moment, as Suma said earlier, I can't remember whether it was Suma or Nick who said earlier, we actually don't know where the cuts are going to happen. There's a lot of speculation on what is going to happen with these cuts. If, however, we see substantial cuts in areas that are most needed, so cuts in areas like public health, cuts in areas of economic growth, cuts in areas um, related to public finance management, systemic reform issues, issues relating to transforming economies, because those are more difficult to sell to the UK public than say bed nets, then yes, we are going to see a big negative impact of the current cuts um, on the South in terms of managing their debts and coming out with a more robust rebound over time. Thank you, Mavis. Um, talking of cuts, we have a question from Harriet Lamb. Can the panel explain at all the cutting of aid to Yemen a country in crisis where aid surely meets our security objectives. Um, unless anyone's super keen, I may come to you, Tom, first of all, given the security link in Harriet's question. Um, I, I find it very hard to add much more than what Mavis has already said, I've got to be honest. She's covered it, uh, I think, uh, entirely appropriately, which is the, the, the challenge of security in aid is, is uh, is that too often we've sold it as a rather simplistic idea that you know you buy somebody X and they won't shoot you or whatever it happens to be. It's actually a rather more, you know, it's 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 rather more about developing the depth of society, uh, and it's more an exercise in civics 101 than it is a, a, on simple tradable, uh, you know, tradable exchange. And I think that's where, um, you know, the development experts that uh, Diffid has been so uh, careful to not only bring together but also to train up. Uh, has have had such an effect and I think that um, you know one of the areas that I, I will be looking at uh, closely and I know others will be as well is is to see whether or not the new FCDO maintains those skills uh, or whether it decides that they are no longer the relevant set of uh, attributes for a rising diplomat. Thank you Tom we've covered um, my next question already but so many people have asked the same variation of it that I, that I think it's worth addressing again. Uh, so this one comes from Oliver Phelan, who is from the International Rescue Committee. What are the political arguments that will persuade the UK government and the Prime Minister to reverse their decision to cut the 0.7 uh, aid target? How can we ensure that the cut is temporary? Um, can I come to you first, Nick? Yeah, um, thank you. Well, um... I, I think uh, we do need to focus uh, firstly on what the practical effect of taking uh, so much out of the budget uh, will be. Um, and I don't think that had been properly foreseen actually by those that agreed to the Treasury's proposal. Because as I mentioned, we have so many multilateral commitments that uh, have to be maintained and indeed the, that's the government's um, objective. And because there are some really very big commitments that needed to be maintained, for instance, in relation to climate change, the global fund and so on, Actually, uh, once those were, were locked in, uh, what has subsequently been appreciated is that the impact on other projects is really quite profound. And so we're looking at programs that um, potentially have to have very big cuts indeed uh, 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 to them. Uh, and we don't yet know um, what those will be because the government hasn't yet announced them. Um, uh, but uh, some of the areas have been speculated on and have been discussed today, including, for instance, uh, aid to Yemen. I mentioned research uh, and, and development. Uh, so I think the first uh, argument is to say um, taking a full third out of the budget uh, 
in, in one year can't be sensible actually for any government program unless you think that money is being wasted and you need to turn off the tap. And actually there is, the government has produced no evidence as the director of the IF, uh, uh, sorry, as the former chairman of the National uh, Public Accounts Committee, Edward Lee has said, government's produced no evidence to suggest that this money is being wasted, no, no analysis. It simply said that the country couldn't afford um, to go on uh, spending this. Well, given that um, actually uh, public spending has been increased by 80 times the sum that it's been reduced by in relation to the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the ODA cut. That is really is not a credible uh, arg argument. Secondly, I think it's important to demonstrate to the government that, to make, as I've tried to suggest, that to make a, a sense of the integrated strategy uh, and the uh, combined department, it doesn't um, it, 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 it really um, uh, uh, doesn't help the government's own objectives to torpedo it in this way by taking uh, so much resource away from the new uh, combined uh, 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 de de department. That that um, uh, it, it, it is not in, in 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 the interest of demonstrating the success of the uh, uh, of of the new strategy and the new new department uh, to withdraw uh, so much. Um, uh, resource uh, from it. And um, thirdly, I think that, uh, I think um, it, 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 it's, it's important to, uh, to, to, to continue to get uh, across this point that um, aid spending uh, has more assessment about whether the outcomes are delivered than any other program in government because of the Independent Commission on Aid Impact. I mean, would that other massive programs had such scrutiny? Uh, and it, it, if the concern is about value for money, then then I think that that, uh, that 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 can be addressed. So I think that there are a multiplicity of arg uh, arguments, and that's not even to trespass into the sort, of, if you like, this political sphere, uh, which is to say that actually it turns out that. Um, a, a proposal like this isn't quite as popular uh, as the government might have hoped because there is significant opposition to it uh, amongst Conservatives. Tom? Uh, look, as, as somebody who um, has voted for things because they were manifesto commitments and knowing, as Nick and, and I have shared, uh, we voted for things because they're manifesto commitments and because that's what we were elected to deliver, even if we're not always comfortable with it. We understand that politics is a team game. Everybody understands that and you work as a political party because that's how you achieve most of your aims. This point seven was a political commitment by literally every one of the 650 members of parliament who were elected. That does raise questions, right? Now, I understand, as everybody else does, that there's a pandemic and this has put extraordinary pressure on public finances. I really do. You know, I can see it in the constituency I'm privileged enough to represent, and I can see it in the country I'm privileged enough to work for. But the reality is that's what the point seven does, is it reduces it automatically. Um, and so it was already going to go down by four billion a year. Now it's going down by nearer to six, seven. Now, what's interesting is actually, if you want to, uh, if you really want to organize a rebellion, what you do is you uh, cut the budget of somebody who used to run Diffit and was also a former chief whip. And uh, Andrew Mitchell is, um, well, all I can say is he knows, he knows how to organize. Seema. Can I just come in on this? Look, um, I think um, it is an extraordinary situation when the cut is uh, been designed and it, it's hitting bilateral aid. And if this is under a conservative government. In my experience, conservatives have tended more than labor to prefer bilateral aid. Um, labor is a bit more multilateralist generally um, than that. But this, I don't, I don't know if anyone did their homework because as Nick said, when they thought about the cut, they should have done an immediate analysis of the number of legal commitments that are already there largely to multilaterals, and therefore the bird was going to fall on bilateral aid. And I think that's extraordinary for a, for a Conservative government to do that. Now, did they do that homework in the Treasury and FCDO and others and present it? I don't know, but it seemed very strange. Secondly, is this permanent? Is this, there seems to be, at least in the press, an argument going on where the Prime Minister saying this is a one-year thing, Chancellor saying, well, not yet, not yet sure. So let's see how that plays out. In terms of um, the uh, sort of how to convinced that maybe this should be reversed. I mean, you know, prime ministers, different prime ministers are motivated by different things. And uh, I would have said one of the things to focus on is obviously the negative publicity around some of these uh, cuts in terms of key partnerships. 
Um, it'll be very interesting to see whether the UK, I mean, I'm not in favour personally in for nationality reservation for international jobs, but I think the UK should compete more for them, as Tom said. But it'll be interesting to see whether the UK managed to hold on to OCHA, for example, the UN uh, you know, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, when it's cut humanitarian assistance by such a large uh, number, and it has an official candidate uh, for that job. Uh, I think that'll be interesting. But, you know, things like the COP26 process, the G7 process, that should impact on the Prime Minister's rethink, really, because if the UK can't advance his agenda in international fora where he is in the lead himself, personally, then that will impact. And other Prime Ministers are motivated by other things. I think when I remember Gordon Brown, he, he's just motivated by development. Uh, he, this is absolutely in his bones. Um, so you don't need these sort of political devices to motivate him. But I think um, with the current cabinet, I hope they'll realize COP26 G7 process will be much more difficult to deliver because of uh, this cut. And maybe that will make force a rethink as well. Can I, forgive me, very rudely leap back in on, on just, Suma just triggered something in my mind that I think is worth pointing out. These cuts obviously will fall more on bilateral than multilateral. That's a reversal of the foreign policy that the government has advocated, which is, surprising. Uh, they will fall on the domestic, so voluntary service overseas, for example, is going to take a huge hit. That again is a reversal of the policy that the government has outlined, which again is surprising. And third, they will fall great, greater on the Commonwealth than they will on other nations, because the, <laughs> that's where the bilateral aid falls, right? Again, that's directly against the policy that the government has told us it's pursuing. So literally on every, all three points, because of the nature, as Suma quite rightly put it, that the legal commitments to multilateral aid and what the Foreign Office did rather brilliantly is uh, slope shoulders on the uh, multilateral commitments away from its budget and onto the aid budget, therefore simply moving them, uh, as it were, uh, offshoring that cost, if you like. Um, this is actually three areas where the cut undermines the government's stated policy and doesn't support it, which is surprising. We've absolutely whizzed through this. Mavis, can I come to you, and hopefully this isn't too unkind, um, to just give you 30 seconds to say a bit about um, what Western governments can do to ensure development work continues to be shaped by stakeholder governments in the Global South. We focused a lot on the UK, so we could get your perspective. Okay, so very quickly, I mean, in terms of where I am sitting, um, a lot of the partner governments that we are working with are focused on the exit out of aid and are looking for development and trade partnerships with countries like the UK. So really looking at listening to what countries are looking for. A lot of countries are talking about an interest in transformational reform. A lot of countries are talking about economic transformation. How do you support economic transformation? And linked to that is looking at our aid and how it supports fragile states. So most countries are surrounded by fragile states in sub-Saharan Africa. And we want to work with the UK on managing fragility while simultaneously growing our economies. And this is fundamental as we move into implementation of the free trade area. Thank you. Thank you, Mavis. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, brief summary of a, of a very, very big question. Thank you so much to uh, all our panelists. We're out of time. I wish we had more. Um, I think we could have we could have kept going for a while. Um, but thank you so much to all our panelists, and um, thank you for giving us so much to think about and reflect on too. As Nick mentioned at the beginning, everyone will be emailed a copy of the report very shortly. So check your inboxes and your spam folders uh, just to be sure. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a very good afternoon. Thank you.